So today I wanted to do something that was a little bit lighter. And I actually wanted to talk about science fiction books or fantasy novels. Um, I'm going to put those together and I'm just going to call them genre fiction for the sake of the video. And I wanted to talk about some genre fiction that I think has a lot of real literary value. So I, I, I want to partly reject the idea that to read genre fiction is to give up on reading good literature. But I do have to admit that a lot of stuff in that space, in those genres, um, it, it, it's pretty plain. Uh, it might tell a pretty good story, but it won't have a lot of other literary merits. So I wanted to take a minute and just recommend a couple of books that I think really kind of buck that trend. I'm going to start by mentioning one series. Uh, it's a series that deserves to be mentioned in any kind of list like this, but everybody knows it so well uh, that there's no point in me talking about it. And that's kind of a, a weird paradox you get when you make this kind of content. Uh, on the one hand, it needs to be mentioned. On the other hand, what else is there to say? And of course, that's that's the Lord of the Rings. Um, I have my, my uh, nice box set here. And I really love The Lord of the Rings, and I really love The Hobbit. I'm not nearly as big of a fan as people I know, um, those people who can read it every year, who really know the details of the Silmarillion or something. Um, but I do think, uh, just quickly I'll say, they're great. Um, the prose is beautiful. It's very non-standard for genre fiction by today's standards. And also, um, Tolkien was writing with a deep familiarity with the Western canon and with a lot of great works of literature, and you can see those influences on the page. So obviously, reading The Lord of the Rings, I recommend it, but you know you don't need me to recommend it. You already know that you should probably read The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. The first real recommendation I want to give, however, is uh, Tigana by Guy Gavriel Kay. Uh, Kay has, I think, two main strengths as a fantasy writer. One is that he is able to write uh, really great prose. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty flowery. It's uh, usually the sentences are quite long. Uh, it has a tendency to create this nice cadence to it. Um, and, and that's one of his greatest strengths. I, I, I often felt like sometimes the narrator, when the narrator was simply speaking, um, as if I was reading a bit of prose poetry, and I just thought, man, more genre fiction should be written like that. More genre fiction should have real attention um, to uh, the details of the prose and the flow and the cadence. And, uh, you know, it just it just blows me away when I read K. And, and I think that probably that's because K is someone who is familiar with lots and lots of great works of literature and doesn't just draw on other genre fiction um, for inspiration. And that might be his biggest strength when it comes to the quality of his writing, sort of his craft. So many uh, genre fiction writers, I think, ignore that aspect of craft. They want to write um, really simple and accessible prose. Um, some of them do this explicitly. Um, I think like a Brandon Sanderson, for instance, he will say that he tries to write simple prose to make his books as accessible as possible. And when you gauge by audience reactions, clearly it's working for him. Um, Kay, on the other hand, seems to really emphasize this part of the craft. And I think that is, is really wonderful and it's one reason he's worth reading. The second strength of Kay's writing is that he is able to draw on um, historical um, settings in a way that some people almost say he writes historical fiction with some fantasy elements. Um, but he often isn't drawing on your typical settings that you would find in a lot of genre fiction. I think most fans of fantasy will know that by default, um, worlds get built and that they kind of look like Middle Earth. They kind of look like Tolkien's worlds. Patrick Rothfuss has a world that's very similar to very similar to Tolkien, though you know different. Robert Jordan, again, similar to Tolkien, though of course different. All of them have their reasons for doing this, um, but it's it's really nice and refreshing when you can see someone grabbing on to different historical examples and sort of building stories out of that. And again, Kay is particularly talented at that. He's able to look at the politics of sort of um, Renaissance Italy, for instance, or the Byzantine Empire, and um, bring those to bear uh, in his stories. And, and he can draw inspiration just very widely, and he gets a lot of little nuances and detail um, that really make the world feel quite rich and complete. For a complete change of pace, though, um, I want to recommend or talk about 
uh, Gene Wolfe. This is the Book of the New Sun series. I would also say that if you're going to read the Book of the New Sun, you should read The Earth of the New Sun, uh, which is the follow-up. Wolf, um, once again, is a great prose stylist. His uh, his prose are a little bit different than Kay's, though, where Kay is writing, um, I almost want to say, kind of like a like a 20th century poet. Um, Wolf has this tendency to almost create like a dreamlike atmosphere, uh, and this actually works very, very well with the story he is trying to tell. Going into just a little bit of detail, uh, and maybe if you haven't read Wolf, you want to skip ahead uh, for a few seconds or so, um, but... Wolf is telling a story of a world that at first seems like a like a fantasy setting, and we quickly learn is actually um, a bit of science fiction. We're learning actually that it might be a world that's set uh, greatly in the future, where there's time travel and there is space travel, and that actually we're seeing lots of uh, mentions of that out in the world, um, and we just never realized it because of the way that it's all kind of taken for granted. And also the way that sort of like sort of courtly or knightly manners have made their way back into the characters' lives. Because of that, there's this weird mix where it feels like a sense of fantasy, um, or as in someone experiencing something or fantasizing. Um, and yet we then learn that the world is so much weirder, stranger, and um, in a twisted way, kind of more magical than we would have thought before. Wolf is also, I think, really good at incorporating um, his sort of basic themes. He is telling a Christ story. Uh, you will see that in lots of genre fiction uh, and just lots of literature in general. Uh, and how he does that, um, I think, gets... And how exactly he does that um, would take way too long to explain in a little short video like this. But it's certainly a real strength of his that he is able to build these themes and tell this grander story within the particulars of the story that he's deciding to tell and also the world that he has built. Wolf is someone who I just know I'm going to have to go back and reread. Like, I don't know if I'll read Tigana again. I want to read more K. Um, but with the Book of the New Sun and the Earth of the New Sun, I just, I just know it deserves to be read uh, several times because of how complex it is and how upon a second or third reading I expect things to just become a little more apparent to me and I expect to find things that I missed uh, and that I would I would really just love to see in a, a little bit clearer now that I kind of know what to look for and then finally as a real gear shift I want to talk about Neil Stevenson's Anathem or Anathem I can never figure out exactly how I'm supposed to say it now I actually recommended this book at the end of our Plato episode when I uh, gave a book recommendation, said, if you liked Plato and you wanted to see maybe some platonic ideas explored in fiction, you should read this book by Neil Stevenson. Um, but I just want to call it out again. This is a fantastic book. This is one of my favorite works of science fiction, and it really is pure science fiction um, because there is a very, very interesting idea that is being explored and it's being explored by building out a very dense and interesting and um, enticing world. And it sort of posits a what if and then just sees where you can go with it. Um, like a lot of really great science fiction, though, um, the what if that's actually being explored is not mentioned on the very first page. Uh, and in fact, it takes quite a while for you to realize what kind of story you've been reading. This is one of those books that I found myself staying up all night to read. I think I originally read it on a Kindle, and when I read it on my Kindle, I uh, was was waking up at like 3 a.m., and I'd be like, okay, I'll just read another chapter, and I'd stay up for an hour, and um, sometimes the light would like bother my wife, and I'd have to cover it, or like, I was like at one point um, underneath the comforter and uh, reading my Kindle so the light wouldn't disturb her, and it was almost like being like a little kid again. Stevenson has a kind of maximalist approach to his prose. Uh, it's like he's going to throw absolutely everything at you, and I just dig it. So many genre fiction writers um, haven't really built up that craft of great prose, and so they know it's very hard for them to do it. Um, they're not going to write like a K or like a Wolf, and so what they decide to do is really lean into simple, clean prose, and I would say if you can't do uh, flowery prose or this sort of very long and elegant prose very well, you should aim for simple prose. That's absolutely right. But when you can do it well, maximalist prose can be 
really great. And in a world where minimalist prose has kind of won out for a while, Stevenson's maximalism really sticks out in a in a really pleasant way. And again, it just makes it so much fun to read. This book really is about like mathematician monks who eventually find out that the world they live in is much stranger than they could have thought. And in fact, that some of their controversial theories about the nature of reality have turned out to be true, but once again, in a way they wouldn't have expected. I genuinely think Stevenson is a master of taking a mystery and sort of unfolding it slowly. So each revelation feels important, and each revelation feels like it's really taught you something fascinating about the world, but you always know that there's there's more happening, there's more to come, and it just keeps you hooked, it keeps you engaged. Um, also, there are, there are these conversations that happen between characters that are so intense, meaning like the dialectic of the, the they're having or that they're engaged in. It's, it's so intense that you would actually have to spend some time unpacking the reasoning to see who really won the argument. Stevenson writes highly intelligent characters and he writes them very well and that's a real challenge for a lot of writers um, because it's always a challenge to write characters who are smarter than you um, in the same way that it's always hard to write characters who are funnier than you but Stevenson he knocks it out of the park all right that's a bit of a light video um, we're going to go back to talking about some of the greats of the Western canon uh, pretty soon. If you want to be around for some of those discussions, don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, we have a podcast at theclassicalmind.com. There is a link in the description uh, where you can just get audio versions of some of the discussions that I and my co-host do. Until then, thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you next time.